Take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts, the book of Acts. I want to bring to your attention a few things that I've said before, and then perhaps uh, a few things you haven't heard before. And uh, look there in verse 20, Acts chapter 7 and verse 20. We're talking about a man named Moses. Everybody's heard of Moses. Just about everybody in the whole world's heard of Moses. And would you believe that one time Moses was just content? Content to live on the backside of a desert. Spent 40 years of his life there. And he was content to be left alone. He didn't want to do anything. He didn't want to go anywhere. He's what you call he had been burned out. You see, he made a commitment and didn't follow through with it. He thought things were going to be different, and it didn't work that way. So you'll find out that as you serve the Lord, not everything's going to work out the way you planned. But there's a God in heaven whose timing is perfect. But notice what he says in verse 20. In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. Uh, When he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up, nourished him for her own son. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. And you ought to underline these three words in your Bible. You see, before he ever went to the back side of the desert, he already knew and believed God was going to deliver the children of Israel by him. He knew it before he ever left. And he says he did what he did because he supposed his brethren, and you ought to underline these three words, he supposed they would have understood. But you know, they didn't understand. Because Moses did something that he shouldn't have done. Now whether or not he got angry or not, may be hard to tell, but when you study the Old Testament you'll find that Moses got angry an awful lot of times. Moses lost his cool. Moses got angry and bitter and um, paid a price for it. And that's one of the reasons he never got to go into the promised land. God let him see the promised land from the top of Mount Nebo, but wouldn't let him enter it. All because he got angry and he did something that God never told him to do. He took matters into his own hands. He thought he had the right to strike the rock twice when he was only supposed to speak. So his anger cost him. His anger cost him here too, I believe. But he says here in verse 25, For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. And it says, But they understood not. The next day he strove showed himself up unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? That must have hit to the quick because he knew somebody knows what he had done. Now he knew that somebody knew that he had murdered an Egyptian and hid him in the sand. You see, at one time he didn't think anybody knew. Nobody knows, but somebody did. Somebody saw. And so the Bible says that he was going to leave. Because it said in verse 28, Will thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begot two sons. When 40 years were expired, 
there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Now, when you read this in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, you'll find that this scripture almost quotes that scripture perfectly tells the story. It shows that what God wrote back there was inspired and quotes it again here. And this is inspired of God. Because the Holy Spirit knows the word and can draw out of those Old Testament scriptures knowledge that is needed for this day. Now, Stevens is preaching a sermon. And as far as we know, it must have been his first sermon and his last sermon. Boy, he must have preached up a storm. One sermon and everybody loved him. No, nobody loved him. It says they stoned him to death. How would you like to preach one sermon and you get stoned to death for it? Well, it says in verse 31, When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of the Father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, it says in the Gospels that Jesus had made the statement to them that God is not the God of the dead. He's a God of the living. And if he says he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must be alive. That's what he said. Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. And get these three statements in this verse, because I'm going to show you these three statements later. I have seen, I have heard, and I will deliver. See that verse 4, 34? I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. I have heard their groanings, and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. Then Moses, whom they refused, said, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Now, you know, there's some things that are not mentioned here. There is a few things that, as the story goes back and draws all of this knowledge and puts it up here for us to see, there's a few things missing. I... um. I want you to take your Bible and look there in the book of Hebrews and chapter 11. Hebrews and chapter 11. You'll notice that there's a few things that's missing in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Now you and I know that God used Noah. But after Noah had, and the ark had landed yeah, he made a sacrifice, but you remember he got drunk and things didn't go too well with one of his sons. But it's not recorded here. You remember Jacob, who was a surplanter? In other words, he was a, a liar, a deceiver. Uh, he wasn't the most upright individual. Uh, Jacob. You know, there's nothing said against Jacob here in chapter 11. Well, even when you talk about, you know, Moses here, and yet Moses, well, he lived 120 years. Not one bad thing about Moses is said here. This is the Hall of Faith chapter. It's what he did by faith, and God is putting in here the things that they did for him. This is what God sees. You see, the day will come when the Bible says the former things will be remembered no more. God is going to reward you and I for what we did do. And those things that we've done will last for eternity. The rewards that God's going to give you will be eternal. So there are some things that God must have forgot about. I wonder if God forgets. You remember all those bad things you did? The Bible says that God won't remember them anymore. 
Well, that's, that's good news. God can forget something. I got a whole bunch of things I want him to forget. I'm so glad I'm going to heaven. But if I got to heaven and God reminded me of all those bad things that I've done, I, I, I'm not sure I want to go. I want to stay here as long as I can and drag my feet and try not to get there too soon. But God says he's forgiven all sins, been removed, blotted out. That's good news. Now here in Hebrews, I want you to see what it says. In verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. He didn't know where he was going to go because God was just going to lead him as he goes. Serving the Lord is not always seeing the way clear. It's just seeing the Lord, trusting the Lord, and one step at a time. And you don't know how it's going to work out. You don't know where he's going to lead you. You don't know how he's going to use you. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or 10 years from now. And reality, it doesn't matter. You really shouldn't care. As long as you're doing what God wants you to do, nothing else matters. God can open doors. God can close doors. And it says that he made promises to... Um, to Abraham. And look in verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged him faithful who had promised. Remember, there's other scriptures whenever he told her, she laughed. And the angel says, you laughed. I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. She did laugh. But that's not found here. Isn't it true also that Abraham didn't always sojourn in the land where he was supposed to, that he wound up going down into Egypt, and he got in trouble. And that woman that he was married to, when she was 75, she was a looker. She was a beautiful woman at 75. Pharaoh wanted her. Woo! At 75? She's my sister. Well, that's not found here. There's a, is a blessing of knowing that there's some things that God's not going to remember and they're not going to be recorded. And that God is a good God to us and God's going to bless us and reward us when we get to heaven, but we're not there yet. So sometimes I like what not only the Word of God says, but what it doesn't say. And it makes a statement here in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. See, that's all we are right now is strangers and pilgrims. Strangers means we're away from God. Pilgrims means we're going home. We're away from God, but we're going home. Doesn't mean that you're supposed to be a be strange or a pill, but you are a stranger and a pilgrim. So the Lord has promised all these wonderful things, and He made promises to them, and they didn't get to fulfill them in their lifetime. They never saw the acquisition of all this land that God had promised. Did you know that God promised them the land from the river of Egypt all the way to the River Euphrates, over there where Babylon is in Iraq. Do you know all that land is going to be belong to Israel? I, I don't know if people understand how big of a piece of property that we're talking about that God promised to Israel. And Israel will be the greatest nation in all the world someday. Now look down there in verse 23. 
By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughters. That's when he was about 40 years of age. You see, he knew and understood who he was, and he believed before he ever went on the backside of that desert. He knew that God was going to deliver Israel by his hand. He just didn't know how God was going to do it or when God was going to do it. But he believed that God was going to do it, and so he committed himself, and he's going to do it, and follow me. And they said, who are you? Who are you? And so he fled and went to the backside of a desert. But you see, before he ever did that, he had already made up his mind, and he chose. He chose the affliction with God's people over the treasures of Egypt. See what he makes a statement here in verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Did you know that what's not here? What's not here is, is those 40 years on the backside of the desert. He didn't put that in there. Just kind of like skipped right over all of that. Now take your Bible and turn to the book of Genesis in chapter 15. The book of Genesis and chapter 15. And you'll notice there in verse 2, Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. God, you, you said that you're going to make a great nation from me, and I'm an old man. Where's this kid? And an a offspring has to come from me. That's what you promised. So how are you going to do this? Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. Lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. Talking about Ishmael. He said, But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and says, Look now toward heaven. Tell the stars, or count the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he says unto him, So shall thy seed be. Whoo, doggy, wouldn't that blow your mind? Have you ever try to count the stars? And verse 6, you ought to underline this verse in your Bible. And he believed God. He believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, even in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians in chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What hath Abraham found? That a man could be justified by faith without the deeds of the law, because Abraham was justified by faith 430 years before the law was ever given to Moses on Mount Sinai. But there's something that God told them here. You are going to have a son, and you are going to have as many as the stars of heaven. So he says there in verse 13, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. So did God tell Abraham in advance that they were going to go to a strange land and they're going to be there for 400 years? Just think America's a little over 200 years old. Give us 200 more years. How many people would there be in this nation? Israel went down into Egypt, about 70 of them. Came out with a couple million. Nobody knows the exact number. Some believe two, two and a half million. 
I don't know, I didn't count them all. But there's a bunch. And God says they'll be there 400 years. And the reason they're going to be there, there for 400 years is because he, God is building a nation and he put them in the best place in the world at that time to take care of them and gave them the choice land of all of Egypt, the land of Goshen. Now, and God used them and blessed them and they were fruitful and they multiplied. And then there came a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And now they begin to put the thumb on them. And became afraid that if an enemy was to attack, Egypt would find that Israel might side with the enemy and destroy Egypt. Therefore, they was going to kill all the male children. Now, did God already say about how long it was going to be? Yes. Isn't it amazing that those years in advance, God had already knew exactly what was going to take place, and the timing has got to be just right. It's got to be just right. Look also what he says there in verse 15. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Well, he should. He was 175 years old. Do you realize that after he had that child, Isaac, at 100 years old, he lived another 75 years, got him another wife and a whole bunch of more kids. I ain't making that up. It's in the book. And then he says there in uh, verse 16, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now this is a list of the people that will be in the land when the time is right. Because God is giving those people time that's in the land of Canaan. And the land of Canaan, Canaan was the son of Ham, and he was the one that had the curse. It was not upon the black folks, it was upon Canaan. Canaan went into the land of Canaan, and they're the one that was under the curse, and God's going to take it away from them, and he gave it to his own people. And see what it says in verse 18? In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt, Unto the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I didn't make that up. It was in the book all along. So this is what God says. Now take your Bible and look there in the book of Exodus and chapter 2. The book of Exodus and chapter 2. And look in verse 21. Verse 21. You see, Moses had left Egypt. And he went on the back side of a desert. And in verse 21 it says, And Moses was, and you ought to underline this word, content. Do you believe that God was going to get Moses out of his comfort zone? He's minding his own business. He had been greatly burned. Because he supposed, and it didn't happen that way. He thought, they would understand. They didn't. Follow me, boys! And they wouldn't follow. He says, so much for this leadership business. If those people are coming out of Egypt, God's going to have to use somebody else. He had the death of a vision. God, you'll have to get somebody else. He went on the back side of the desert and was content. See there in verse 21? To dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. She bare him a son, called his name Gershom Shah Solomon. No, just Gershom. Y'all know the guy named Gershom Solomon? I met him over there in Israel, and I interviewed him 20-something years ago. 20 years ago, I guess. And it says here in uh, chapter 3 that, Moses kept the flock. Now, he was content doing nothing more than herding sheep, just taking care of some sheep. Can you imagine that God has taken this little old sheep herder from the backside of a desert who was in the pits and had finally got content 
this is, this is good enough. This is all I'll do. And he never thought of what was coming down the road, of how much God could do with him. He never saw it. Did you know that a lot of times, that's the way you and I are. We don't see down the road. And we can't see what God's going to do. Can you imagine uh, a few years ago when I lived in Georgia, in the backwoods of Georgia, when my daddy was a bootlegger, when I went barefooted to school and wore overalls. I never didn't go to church, didn't know one verse of the Bible, didn't know there were books in the Bible. At that time, I didn't even know there was a Bible. And that's the truth. Never saw my mom and dad have prayer. How in the world is God ever going to use that little old snotty-nosed Georgia boy? He don't know anything. But there was a hunger. And then how the Lord worked it out to where I came across this man. And I believe the Lord opened doors and in his perfect timing, a man sat down with me and explained the gospel to me. And I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I had never finished high school. As I look back over all those years, it blows my mind. Did you realize that you may be sitting here right now and you think, well, it's, it's all over. I'm already, maybe I'm, I'm an old man, or maybe you don't have this, you don't have that. You haven't let the Lord work on you yet. It ain't over yet. When I think about some of these things, I thought, almost 40 years ago, 1968, I went to Colorado. 43 years ago. And it seems like some things won't work beautifully, and it's some things it seems like it's just a dud. And sometimes you think, I would be just as content to be on the backside of some mountain, just going elk hunting and deer hunting and minding my own business and just doing my thing. Just whatever I wanted to do. Because whenever you serve the Lord, you've got to serve people, and people are problems. You got ten people, you got ten problems, minimum. Most people have a hundred problems each. Then if you got a hundred people, you got at least a hundred problems. I think being on the back side of that desert doesn't sound too bad. Just herding some sheep. In Colorado, I worked at a turkey farm. Bunch of turkeys. You ought to work with turkeys. They're worse than sheep. Got to be. But as he goes through here and, and he mentions a few things, and look in verse 7. And the Lord says, I have surely, I've seen the affliction. He says, and I've heard their cry. And I know their sorrow. Now, if he knew this about those people at that time down in Egypt, do you believe that God in heaven that could see that sees you? And the Lord sees your afflictions. The Lord can hear your cry. The Lord knows your sorrow. Can you believe that? Do you believe that because of what God wanted to do, God was looking for the right person to do the right thing? Do you think God in heaven knew where Moses was hiding? Do you think God knew that Moses was content? He had a wife and kid now, backside of a desert. He just heard and she. Did you think God knew where he was? Did you think God knew that he was going to walk by this one burning bush? Who do you think made that bush burn? Just a coincidence? No, I don't think so. In verse, 20, uh, verse 10, he says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, 
the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? Who made you a ruler and a judge? You see, Moses has been humbled. There's no pride. He had been stripped. You see, before he had been trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, he was somebody. And God says, whenever you think you're somebody, God says he'll have to humble you. But if you humble yourself, then God will exalt you. So Moses was about as low as you can get. He could walk under the belly of a snake on stilts. That's pretty low. And verse 11, and Moses said unto God, Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Down in verse 30, 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? See, the question changed from, Who am I? But who are you? Who am I? Who are you? What's your name? Because he, he wanted to be sure. Do you know that he gave to God five excuses on why he was not the man for the job? He did not believe he was the man for the job. And so he says, you just need to get somebody else. See there in verse 13? He said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he says, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. Look at the timing. Forty years has passed. And lo and behold, here comes Aaron his brother. Just a coincidence. Moses says, I, I can't speak right. Did you know at one time the Bible says that when he was learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was great and mighty in word and deed. But now something's happened over the 40 years. Either he lacked confidence or he couldn't speak right. Something was wrong. And he didn't want God to use him. He says, get somebody else. So God used Aaron. Did you know in spite of all the things that Moses did for the Lord and all the rewards he's going to get when he gets to heaven, I believe that Moses also robbed himself of a lot because he made God angry with him and didn't do some of the things that God told him to do. You see, your obedience is going to get you an awful lot with God. But your disobedience is also going to cost you. I have met people over the years that have told me point blank. And that have talent, that have ability. I will not. I said, can I count on you? Nope. I said, why don't you let God use your talent? Because I don't want to. I don't want to do it. And I thought, man, I, I wish I had the talent and ability some of the people have that tell God no. Isn't it a shame to be able to have so much potential and then never use it for the Lord? Did you think that you could be given a talent from God and then not use it for the Lord and escape the consequences? I don't think so. I think God will take out the razor strap. And God may have to put you on the backside of a desert for 40 years or put you on a shelf and not use you. 40 years later, it was God's timing. He finally got Moses where Moses needed to be. Humble. So convinced in his own mind, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Now God can use him. See, God can't use you when you have so much confidence in yourself. 
because then you don't trust the Lord. You try to manipulate, try to figure out a way that you can make it happen instead of just trusting the Lord and see how God's going to work things. We don't always understand all these things. But I work on the principle that I believe, according to the Bible, God has great things in store for all of his children. He left you here for a reason. There's a purpose. Just like I asked this morning about this little piece of paper to fill out just to see what people might be able to do, how they, we might be able to use them in a greater way. But you know what? There will probably be a bunch of people that will, I will not. It ain't nobody's business where I work or what I do or what I can or cannot do or my educational background or my professional ability. I'm not, I'll do whatever I want when I get ready and I'm not ready and blah, 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 blah. And I'll never know what they could have done because, see, God has to use me. And I have to know what I can do. You see, I can't read minds. God hasn't given me that ability. I'm not God. I'm just a man. And I want to do God's work, God's way, with God's people, with God's given talents. And I want God's blessings. And I think we, could, we can do that. But there are times when, just like Moses, I supposed that they would understand. And not everybody's going to understand. It won't matter what the dream may be or what the goal may be. There's always somebody that carries around with them a bucket of cold water. You know what that's for? So they can throw it on your dreams. So they can wipe it out. There's always people that are a little bit on the negative side. But praise the Lord, there's always somebody that says, Preacher, you can use me. I'll do whatever it takes. You can count on me. Blah, 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 blah. And I think that's, that's wonderful. What we could have done for the Lord if all of God's people worked together to get something accomplished. I have seen the death of visions and dreams but I've also lived long enough to see a lot of things fulfilled. I used to tell the kids in college, your dreams are more likely to be fulfilled if you don't oversleep. Too many people just oversleep, never get out of bed spiritually, just never wake up. But anyway, you know the Lord, you know you're going to heaven when you die and it doesn't hurt to find just a little bit of things about man like Moses. And you may find yourself on the back side of a desert. And you might even get content. And lo and behold, uh, here you are doing fine. And along comes Pastor Arnold. And he wants to wake you up out of your comfort zone. And may call upon you to do something that you've never done before in your little life. Are you ready? Are you ready? Or are you going to hide? Are you going to run? Don't leave me now. You've got me here. We're in this together. Look up here. Letting this hand represent you and me, and this wallet represents sin. You and I have sinned. We have come short of God's perfection. We've all done things wrong. But God says that he loves us and that he hates our sin. But the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. But God says to go to heaven, we have to be perfect, as righteous as God. And none of us are perfect, none of us are righteous. We've all sinned and come short of God's righteousness. So God says you can't save yourself. You cannot earn your way to heaven. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord, God in the flesh. He came into the world because he loves us, but he hates what we do wrong. And he says our sin separates us from him. So Jesus Christ, who had no sin, didn't have to die, took our sins and died in our place. 
And God says that if we'll believe that he paid for our sins and was buried and came back again from the dead, if we would believe he did it for us, he would give us as a free gift everlasting life. And he says, these things have I written unto you that believe that you may know that you have eternal life. Can you know you have eternal life? I know that I have eternal life and that I'm going to heaven when I die. Best news in the world. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. If you have, have never trusted the Lord, or if you're watching by internet tonight, right where you are, just simply say something simple like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Christ died, paid for my sins, and I'm going to trust him to take me to heaven whenever I die. And friend, God said if you would trust him, he would save you and give you eternal life. Just like this morning I gave the invitation, just like I'm doing now. And I asked for a raise of hands. Somebody in the back did raise their hand. I found out later, but I didn't know it. I don't always see it. But I got some good news for you. The Lord does. The Lord sees every individual in this room. He sees every person that's watching by internet. And he knows if you believe that his son paid for your sins. He knows if you believe that he came back from the dead. And he knows that your trust in him is your only hope of going to heaven. And God says because of what he knows, he's going to give to you as a free gift everlasting life. Will you trust him? Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us for this time together. Bless each one.